thank you for the introduction. I appreciate uh, the invitation and the opportunity to share our attempts to do anti-aging research and drug, drug development. So, um, uh, I will go with you through the history of our attempts to understand what is the driver of aging. Uh, with uh, This was a curly road with uh, significant twists and um, uh, I quickly go through the major twist and then we'll uh, appear on uh, where we are today <coughs> and we'll see what uh, we can do based on what we understand. So, um, long ago, from Mechnikov's times, uh, aging has been uh, recognized as something which strongly resembles uh, poisoning. Uh, this uh, feeling actually I think is shared by majority of us today. The question is who is the poisoner? Uh, today the most, uh, there are several popular uh, sources of, uh, for this role. Uh, the most popular today um, is uh, senescent cells, uh, cells which become irreversibly growth arrested in response to the DNA damage which according to uh, the uh, advocates of this theory are filling us with life, with age, and starts poisoning us through the products of their secretion, named SASP, Senescence Associated Secretory Phenotype, causing systemic decline of all functions, which we recognize as aging. Um, so, uh, uh, if we uh, project this theory on our uh, trajectory of our life, uh, we know very well that today, thanks to the achievements of medicine, um, lots of people can achieve very uh, serious age, above 90 years old, which was unachievable even 30 years ago. Uh, but then they massively die and uh, nobody lives longer than 120 years, indicating that uh, by treating age-related diseases, uh, we cannot really extend uh, the lifespan significantly, meaning that today, we are not treating the right cause of aging. Uh, the, by aging here I mean uh, the, the, this longevity cliff, this uh, reaching unavoidable uh, frailty which leads to death eventually. So, uh, if indeed senescent cells or something like that is responsible for, for this and the accumulation becomes reaches a critical point here, mm, uh, the, um, then they are the right target. And of course, as we all know, <coughs> senolytics today are uh, being seen as one of the hopes. However, after working about five, six years with senolytics ourselves, and we were the, actually the first group, as far as I know, who started uh, isolating molecules to kill senescent cells, we actually came to a significant revision of this theory without touching its main postulate. So we published a number of papers in which we, uh, disappointingly to ourselves, uh, recognize that what people uh, think are senescent cells, uh, and we know today that in vivo they are being recognized for two properties. They turn blue when you stain them in acidic pH with X gal, that's so-called senescent associated beta gal, uh, and the second is P16 activation. So it appears that this pair of properties far from being accurate and exclusive for senescent cells. And there are many other cells in the body which actually uh, express this pair of properties. The most abundant of which are macrophages uh, in a certain type of reprogramming, uh, which uh, obviously also secrete something, but they cannot be killed by senolytics. Meaning that killing of P16 positive cells in genetic models of uh, anti-aging treatment is not equivalent to using senolytics because senolytics cannot kill very large proportion of cells uh, and uh, so senescence are, uh, cells among this are only a minor fraction. Therefore, without revising the main postulate of this theory, we decided not to uh, go in deeply into distinguishing what is senescence, what is not senescence, but, but we are taking as given that with life, we have accumulation of bad cells. Let's name them damaged cells. And we would like to reduce their influence on our organism. And uh, instead of trying to kill them all together because they are so diverse that I can't imagine a single drug which would clean us from all of them, we decided to uh, do a different thing. So, 
we decided to focus on the mechanism of their generation and on the mechanisms of their eradication uh, which is occurring in normal life. Because uh, it's uh, pretty obvious that all garbage which we are generating uh, during life is very effectively being cleaned by specific branches of immunity. We know some of them, we know how erythrocytes or aged erythrocytes are being cleared, but we don't know very well what is the branch of immunity which deals with uh, cleaning of the garbage uh, which uh, exists in the manifest in the form of uh, damaged cells. We only started learning a little bit about that. We know that dam damaged cells besides secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines which acting as a signal, find me, eat me, to immune system. They also uh, have uh, modifications of the membrane, such as uh, oxidized vimentin, as we recently published, which is being recognized by innate immunity branch of humoral immunity by uh, naturally occurring antibodies encoded in our genes. So this only tells us there is a branch of innate immunity dealing with these cells, but we're still far from understanding that. So, if this uh, picture is right, then we constantly live under two situations. First, we have a constant full influx of damaged cells through DNA damage, through the mechanism which we still uh, need to understand. And there is a constant uh, cleaning of these cells from the body, and as long as these two things are in balance, we are healthy and alive. So, uh, the first question, who is this damaged cell generator? Obviously, it is not environmental factors, because if it would be them, then some people or some mice would live many, many times longer than others. And we don't see that. We know that there is a, antioxidants have a very limited effect on the lifespan. So this factor has to be endogenous, genetically determined, and species-specific, because obviously every species of mammals, and I'm speaking only about mammals, uh, they, it has a pretty well-defined, genetically defined longevity. So, uh, recently, a uh, uh, young big uh, paper came out uh, where um, somatic cells of humans of different age were uh, subjected to single cell <coughs> deep sequencing, uh, finally demonstrating uh, accurately that there is exponential growth of cells with damaged DNA uh, uh, with mutations in somatic tissues which is occurring in humans. And uh, we can be now sure that with age, our DNA ages. So, uh, what are the, is, do we have anything in our genes which fits this definition? Being intrinsic endogenous, being species specific, and being capable of creating DNA damage. And when we look at the genome, we do find something like that. Uh, and uh, I will show you that now we are quite confident that what we found is, is actually real. About half of our genome is formed by the products of reverse transcription. To, uh, the, the virus-like elements belonging mostly to two categories, lines and signs, short and long in, in, in interspersed nuclear elements. So uh, uh, they all together form nearly, well, together with satellite DNA, and by the way, satellite DNA also can amplify through reverse transcription. So all together they form half of genome, which I think deserves the term therefore introduced the term retrobiome, which corresponds to the 50% of length of our DNA. So, and uh, for years, for decades, we have been looking at this retrobiome as a cemetery, as an uh, archaeological remains of something which happened so long ago, we don't need to be bothered with that. Reality appears that indeed, the majority of these elements are dead, because they acquired lots of mutations uh, being uh, in our genome for years of neutral evolution. But still, part of them are alive and technically capable for further expansion. So, to a certain degree, we can look in our genome as the uh, plethora of viruses, among which very few protein coding genes are diluted. So we are the home built by viruses, uh, to a certain degree, and to, 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 because they are much more abundant than any other genes. So, um, well, how all this works? All this, uh, all this uh, retrobiome, which consists of several different types of uh, families, two of which are the most abundant and counted in millions of copies, mm, all of this, all the expansion is driven by one enzyme. This enzyme is encoded by one of this family of repeats named line one, and uh, this uh, line one is a long repeat, uh, which looks like a normal gene encoding two open reading frames. Um, and, and the only difference from regular 
uh, gene is that its promoter is inside the transcribed region, which means that since one of the proteins encoded by this thing is reverse transcriptase, it can make a cDNA copy of its own RNA, and when this cDNA copy gets integrated back, it's functional gene. If the same is happening with a regular gene, which starts downstream of its promoter, the cDNA of spliced RNA, when it's put back into the genome, become makes pseudogen, the gene which is inactive because it's not only intronless but it's promoterless. We have about 5,000 copies of that in our genome. So, but lines are pseudogens, their pseudogens are alive and they multiply through this polymerase chain reaction in which not the temperature goes up and down like in PCR but instead reverse transcriptase and, and, and RNA polymerase together form PCR. So, uh, and uh, if they would be allowed, this process would continue. So this reverse transcriptase is an interesting enzyme because it's, uh, so this is a uh, zoom on the structure of line one. It has two proteins, one of which seems to be a chaperone uh, for specifically serving this very primitive virus. This is reverse transcriptase, very long protein, almost 200 kilo delta, which has polymerase activity, RNA H activity, and endonuclease activity, which plays the role of integrase. So, uh, when you have the cell with activated line 1, and this cell starts expressing this ORF2 protein, which is, line, uh, which is uh, reverse transcriptase, and by the way, we have about 150 copies in our DNA of still, uh, of still live and technically intact line 1s. So, uh, and uh, th this process of reverse transcription starts, it leads to the situation of a super mutagenic phenotype. Why? Because endonuclease constantly makes holes in DNA which require repair, and this repair is constantly ongoing, obviously generating point mutations as if the cell would have a piece of uranium inside. And we know it because we uh, mimic that all in the experiment. So, uh, the new copies of integrations of these repeats they, at the moment of integration, they are not yet under negative control of homologous recombination. And the homologous recombination, which goes one against another, uh, provokes uh, deletions and amplifications. So, uh, to, to, to a certain degree, uh, reverse transcriptase uh, induces all type of uh, mutations we know today. So, how, uh, how did we get them? And what is their evolutionary history? It's quite interesting, and it's very well, by the way, uh, uh, restored. The evolutionary history of uh, retro elements is very well restored. So, line ones are very, very ancient elements. They spread out the whole eukaryotes. Drosophila has a number of them, not that abundant though. Um, uh, and uh, they, their uh, ancestry goes back to hundreds of millions of years, and we can't really find where they start. However. What we know is when this short interspersed repeat started. They started uh, because they uh, well, first of all, we know that the amplification of these repeats happened as a series of explosions. So uh, about 65 and 70 million years ago, there was no zoo. If you would make, want to make a zoo of mammals, it would be a very boring zoo. It would be just a few species with a which look very, you know, like rats or or, uh, or something like that, according to paleontological remains. But then, through a very, very short evolutionary time, some people think as short as half a million years, you suddenly start getting the whole zoo. This was the peak of creativity of evolution. Something happened when all diversity of mammals appeared in a very short evolutionary time, after which there was no major, um, there was no major inventions after that, because after that, only adaptive evolution inside pre-existing uh, morphological structures occurred. So, all these bats, whales, rodents, primates, they appeared at once at one evolutionary time. How can it be? What is driving that morphological diversity? We can tell that with almost 100% accuracy. These were amplifying signs, short interspersed repeats, because each of these genus, which is drawn here, have their own class of signs. All primates have a loop, all rodents have B1, B2, B3, all dogs have C1, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, which means that at this moment of time, we, uh, we were ma there was a massive explosion of short interspersed elements, which are driven by the same reverse transcript, they're so short they cannot encode anything. 
they are just ideal templates for this reverse transcriptase, and they originate from small RNAs, such as tRNAs or small nuclear RNAs or cell RNAs. So every species at this moment of time, our predecessors underwent massive malformations and formation of lots of freaks. Majority of them probably died. And all those who had very long genome and therefore cannot be killed by massive insertions of thousands of copies of new repeats, they got selective advantage. That's why we have such a strange genome, which is so big, because those who had a compact genomes didn't have a chance to survive that. And uh, then uh, these freaks actually had to find a place where to live. If you lose both all your four limbs and have little protrusions, you, the only place you can live is in the sea. That's probably how whales evolved. And so on and so Basically, this diversity was not exactly the Darwin's evolution. It was evolution based on the appearance of diversity of morphological forms, which adapted to certain dishes and since then occupied them. After that, Darwin's evolution continued. So why do I, you may say, well, it's a fairy tale. How do you know that it's all true? I can tell you, I, uh, well, and my hypothesis is that by acquisition of raptor elements at, during this turbulent time, uh, all species acquired the uh, clock of uh, the timer of light, and the uh, the longer, uh, the, the more uh, uncontrolled retrobiome they get, the shorter is their life. So, uh, and this is so. Uh, my hypothesis is that uh, retrobiome is the important part of the biological timer of longevity, and uh, every species is its first generator of DNA damage. So. Uh, the, uh, why do I know, oops, my goodness, I don't know, computer did it, it's not me who, <laughs> who made this mess. But I can tell you that the reason we know that what I'm telling is most likely true is the results of genetic analysis of one species of mammal, which is the most diverse in terms of its morphology. We know who this species is, are dogs. There is no other species in which you have such a tremendous difference in the morphological appearance from very small to tremendously big, from long legs, short legs, long nose, short nose, and uh, all other habits. So every time, and you may ask why dogs are so, there is so much evolutionary plasticity here? And the answer is very well defined. So now if you look in literature and see what is known about the genes, uh, those which are mapped, have been mapped, uh, which are responsible for short legs of corgi or dachshund, and for a short nose of boxer, every time it's a line element sitting in a new place of the gene. They're really morphogenes. And to me, it's a great indirect proof that this is uh, actually happened over here when we created this zoo uh, 65 million years ago as a result of this massive endogenous infection explosion of lines. So, obviously, this was extremely dangerous content which we acquired. And evolution since then did everything to stop them from uh, uh, amplification. So today we know at least a dozen mechanisms to keep them epigenetically silent, or even if they are not epigenetically silent, to kill them at the level of RNA or at the level of transport to the nucleus. So uh, DNA, they're heavily, in, in, their promoters are heavily methylated at DNA level. Uh, 13 6 uh, by, by uh, deacetylating histones in the places of the location blocks access of transcription machinery to them. Uh, P53 is suppressing the expression of the mechanism which we still do not understand. Uh, however, even if transcription starts, there are PV, Apobec, and other mechanisms which kill the RNA. By the way, working only in germline cells is the most precious. But even if all these things fail, there is the last line of defense because the moment they start uh, doing their reverse transcription. They start, uh, you know, the cell recognizes that as massive viral invasion, activates interferon response, which is that famous signal, find me, eat me to the immune system. So, uh, nevertheless, regardless of all these precautions, the fact that we have them uh, still means that there is a chance that they get activated and create their progeny. How do we know that? We know that now through multiple uh, sources. Uh, for example, this is our own work. Uh, work done in collaboration with um, uh, Biobank at Cornell University in Ithaca. So these are two female dogs from which uh, DNA was isolated from peripheral blood cells six years apart. Three years and nine years old, six years and 11 years old from the same animal. And it underwent deep uh, whole genome sequencing 
followed by mapping of new line ones integrations in them and sign integrations. And you see that in both those, both lines and signs, increase in numbers with age. And they are spread out the whole all over carrier type without any specific selectivity. So together with Jan Vick's data, this shows that indeed with time DNA gets old and it changes content in this particular case by increasing the number of repeats. So, uh, health life, uh, living living is a balance between ongoing DNA damage uh, caused by retrobic bio and constant immune surveillance which find the cells are killed. As long as it goes, we are okay. However, if we reach the stage of immune senescence, and we know very well that the immune system gets exhausted, and we know it from the inability to effectively vaccinate old people, so uh, as well as many other things, uh, we probably have a reduction of ability of this cleaning machinery to work, and DNA damage continues, and therefore you have, uh, you have indications of aging, inflammation, and so on. So, what can we do knowing this? We can do two things. We can either try to block retrobiome, and, and since remember the key thing here is that expansion of retrobiome is happening through the uh, mechanism which involves activity of only one enzyme, so which is druggable as we know from other viruses. Or we can try to stimulate that particular branch of immunity or attract adaptive immunity, which will help us to do this cleaning better. That's what exactly is our team is doing. And uh, uh, let me show you where we are here. So first, the first obvious target is reverse transcriptase itself. So recently, uh, two um, important papers came out with one month interval, uh, one of which is uh, uh, John C. Davis' paper in Nature, uh, a month later, Vera Gorbunova's paper, which we contributed uh, as collaborators to in, uh, uh, in cell metabolism basically showing one important thing, that inflammation associated with aging is driven by the, uh, the repression of line 1 elements, which start making cDNA in cytoplasm. This cDNA is recognized by the, the innate immunity mechanism made to recognize viruses, because there is no other DNA in cytoplasm about viruses which activates interferon. Interferon drives inflammation. Inflammation, according to John C. DV, is that mysterious SASP. So SASP, which for years has been attributed to NF-kappa V, most likely NF-kappa V is involved there, but the driver is an interferon. And that with all the downstream events so well uh, you know, predicted and uh, started by Judy and other lovers of senescence. So, so uh, by looking at this, we wanted to see, and these are several pictures from uh, paper with, from various paper with, with some of our um, help. So this is uh, just to demonstrate what it, the, the beauty of this is that reverse transcriptase inhibitors are available from antiviral um, uh, medicine. There are inhibitors of, of HIV and uh, hepatitis B. Some of them are so promiscuous that they even can inhibit line one reverse transcriptase, such as stavudine or lamivudine, nucleoside inhibitors. They by they, by definition, are not very selective. That's why they're not perfect, but they're good to generate proofs of principle. So, look at this. Uh, this is the cytokine array demonstrating the uh, profile of naturally occurring uh, uh, cytokines in the blood of old mice. And these mice of the same age, which for a couple of months were drinking water with a inhibitor of reverse transcriptase, by naked eye you see that there's a day and night difference in terms of reduction of uh, general systemic sterile inflammation. So uh, these are uh, typical, uh, typical partners, uh, typical c components of SAS. Again, uh, by <coughs> keeping mice on drinking water with stevia, you see quite dramatic reduction uh, in the uh, uh, expression of these two factors in multiple tissues. The problem is, however, that this thing doesn't, did, not bring, uh, did not solve the problem of mice which naturally, genetically are made deficient for control of line 1 and die on day 30 after death because of the massive uh, you know, negative consequences of line 1 expression, certainly six knockout mice. So again, from the, from the same paper, demonstration that it, with these inhibitors of reverse transcriptase, they greatly extend the life of these mice, but only not more than two times. So from 30 to 60 maximum. It's a great result, but at the same time, not too great for these mice. 60 days is not too much. 
So, you may ask, if we put so much uh, value in, in these things, why they're still dying? You may say, oh, because these inhibitors are not perfect. They're actually quite perfect, because the degree to which they inhibit interferon uh, induction in these mice, which is caused by this C-gas pathway, is actually complete. From the point of view of inflammation, they're not inflammation-carrying uh, mice, but they still die. The reason they die is also shown in that paper, because this is the amount of spontaneous apoptosis ongoing in the hematopoietic organs and in small intestine, the places which suffer usually from acute radiation syndrome. And you see it was very high in knockout mice, and, but with, with inhibitors of reversible scriptase, they become somewhat lower, but far from being completely down. And indeed, the morphology of their guts never return back to normal, and these mice are actually dying from acute radiation syndrome. You say, why? The answer is very simple. Remember, reverse transcriptase of line one has two major activities, polymerase and endonuclease. And endonuclease cannot be suppressed today by anything because nobody ever bothered to make a drug against that. And most likely, this death is occurring because we only suppressed inflammation, but we did not suppress the major source of DNA damage occurring in these mice. So, which means that I would like to modify this picture, which I showed you already. So we have a, there's a great target, reverse transcriptase, which can stop generation of cytoplasmic DNA and block inflammation. But there is another target, which is even more desirable, which is endonuclease, which creates insertions, deletions, amplifications, point mutations, and also contributes to all of this. And today we cannot say to what extent we will change the situation we block that. We are on the way to do it, as you will see in a minute. So, effective inhibition of uh, pathologies driven by uh, reverse transcriptase of line one most likely requires inhibition of both polymerase and endonuclease activities. So, let's say that we have generated them now, and we have them, and uh, we need to now bring them to the clinic. How we would do that? Obviously, bring anything to the clinic through uh, direct anti-aging is impossible due to regulatory hurdles because there is no such disease as aging. You have to pick some age-related disease, uh, treat it, and then uh, simultaneously in the same people you can try to see anti-aging effects, and then eventually will uh, bring you to the success when FD finally wakes up and makes the aging a, a disease, right? So that's the uh, path which every company in the world follows. So, is there any disease which we are quite confident about being driven by activity of retrobiol? We found such disease. This disease is not cancer itself, but its ability of cancer to evolve and become drug resistant. Cancer kills us not because it, 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 with primary tumors. Yeah, primary tumors are always, uh, always very uh, easy to uh, actually to, uh, to to treat. Cancer kills us because of its creativity, its ability to constantly generate new versions which avoid any uh, available therapy. So, what we did, we took two models of cancer, both uh, transgenic, both spontaneous. One with breast cancer, uh, and the reason we took breast cancer is because when you looked at the expression of lines, not weeds, uh, from review, lines are expressed in our body practically exclusively in cancer. Uh, there are several other places, but they are behind uh, uh, barrier. But uh, in somatic cells, it's mostly cancer. But when they are expressed in cancer, in, in, in breast cancer, 98 percent of breast cancers express line one. So we took mice, which uh, are a famous model, which have HER2 new oncogene un under promoter, which is expressed only in their mammary glands. And these mice develop tumors and females and die within a year and a half, 100% from cancers. Well, if you treat them with stavudin in drinking water, you don't see much. You have a, just a little bit of extension of life, but very small. Uh, however, if you make, treat these tumors with this reagent, which basically works in 100% efficacy and all tumors disappear. They disappear, and the moment they disappear, you either continue keeping them on this drug, or you keep them on this drug, and then you add stavudin in drinking water. So then relapses start. So this is the model of drug-resistant relapses. And this is the, the dynamic of appearance and death of mice following full, recover, full uh, complete response. So you see, on normal water, they die with this speed. On water with stavudin, you have more than about three times increasing uh, 50% uh, you know, rate of, 
um, over, or drug resistant relapse occurs. So you have magnificent effect. You're blocking cancer ability to invent mechanism of resistance. This, the other model was run by well, collaborators in Australia when they have a mouse model when, uh, which under neuronal promoter express and MIC and all these mice develop neuroblastomas in their belly. From the moment of diagnosis to death is a very short period of time. Stevudine alone does nothing. It has no effect on direct antitumor effect. Then you apply standard of care, which you apply to children. Many mice live longer, but they practically all develop resistance and finally die. If you put on top of standard care stevidine in water, you see that half of mice never develop <coughs> relapses and actually live normal life. So basically, for the first time in oncology, we have the situation when not cancer viability is the target, but cancer adaptability and plasticity. So all this together brought us to the um, uh, situation when A, we would like to test it in, 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 in patients, and one of our things which we are doing is, is going this direction. Second, we are testing it in dogs, and we are doing it at Cornell University, and this organization named VICA, you can look at the website, uh, and we have uh, retired sled dogs which we are putting into Lemurgen to see what will happen with them. And we established a company, which you will be presented to you as a company tomorrow, named Genome Protection, because we believe that protection of our genome from these guys is essential for, uh, to, to, to reach uh, uh, our desirable endpoint. And this company is developing new, proprietary, highly selective and specific inhibitors of reverse transcriptase and endonuclease of line one. And uh, we have uh, generated a number of assays for each of them, both bi uh, biochemical and biological. And now we already have selective inhibitors. Stevidine, as you see, inhibits both HIV and line one reverse transcriptases. Our compounds no longer work against HIV. They're highly selective against line one. And therefore, they have made a very big leap towards their, um, towards their um, you know, ultimate, ultimate clinical uh, implementation. So uh, they are even more efficacious in, in, vivo, more, in vivo testing. The same thing with endonuclease. We do have first molecules that appear to be very difficult molecule to make, uh, to make the drugs, but we already have uh, molecules which selectively inhibit that endonuclease without touching others and rescuing cells from its DNA damaging problems. I'm finishing up. I see the signal that I'm taking too long. The last, just the conclusion. Our aging paradigm, and paradigm uh, which uh, our company Genome Protection is based on, is that aging is a progressive DNA damage plus immunosenescence. Genome protection is developing se several classes of, uh, of, of drugs which are supposed to counteract this activity. Two of them I introduced to you. We are developing reverse transcriptase, polymerase inhibitors, and then the nuclease inhibitors which are supposed to stop the process of generating damaged cells. We are making vaccines to allow adaptive immunity to get rid of these cells which activate line ones. And we already have the stimulators of immunity, which can very efficiently activate that particular branch of immunity, which can help to clean somatic tissues from these cells. So I will finish here. This is the list of people behind the data. Uh, I'm pleased to see some of them in this audience, uh, such as Vera, Fedichev, and. Uh, Katerina Andrianova, Yakov Kogan, uh, and uh, these are people who are working in this organization who are behind the data. Thank you very much.